Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture which we read just a moment ago. Over in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 20, we'll be looking particularly at three verses in that chapter. And we will also be looking at Proverbs chapter 10 uh, and two verses in that chapter. So if you want to stick like a little bookmark so you can find it quickly when the time comes, over to Proverbs and chapter 10, verses 6 and 7. All right, our scripture reading for today was from 1 Timothy chapter 1, and I want to tie that to Proverbs chapter 10. I'll read the two verses to you. Blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Today is Memorial Day Sunday, the day in which we remember our brave troops since the days that America became a nation, faithful men and women who have fought for our freedom, in particular, so that we might have the freedom to worship God without government interference. So let me publicly say thank you to those who have made the ultimate sacrifice and have laid down their lives on the altar of freedom. And thank you to the troops who today are standing in defense of that freedom. Throughout the history of the world, totalitarian governments view themselves as having the position and absolute authority of God. As a result, they want no competition from the true God of heaven for the hearts and minds of men. Unregenerate men hate the true God. Unregenerate men will do anything that they can do to keep the true God from being worshipped. Unregenerate men will oppress and kill those who hold to a higher allegiance than to their petty human governments. Even today there is a horrible struggle going on in so-called Christian America where Satan's silly, depraved little human munchkins, his petty pawns, try to stop all public expression of Christian ethics, Christian morals, and Christian principles in the public venue. They do not want you to have freedom of speech or freedom of the press or freedom of conscience or freedom of religion. Eventually, they do not want you to even have these freedoms in private. In other words, they do not want you to be free at all. In your bulletin, you have two bulletin inserts today on the subject dealing with freedom and some other materials as well. I hope you have time to read them. The one that's entitled The Price of Freedom lays out the first three essentials. Number one, freedom is a gift from God. Freedom is a gift from God. That was even admitted by Thomas Jefferson who said, and I quote, God who gave us life gave us liberty at the same time, unquote. In other words, freedom is not the gift of government. Number two, Jesus, Jesus made it clear that freedom is a gift of love. Freedom is a gift of love. Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You've heard the hundreds of stories from all over the world where a soldier, because he loved his comrades, fell on a grenade and killed him but spared the life of his friends. Number three, and this is so essential, freedom requires sacrifice and warfare. Freedom requires sacrifice and warfare. We're in a great spiritual war with the enemy of our souls who wants to steal our freedom in Christ. Friends, you have no options. You must fight the battle and win. 
The second insert that you have in your bulletin today is entitled Back to Basics. It lays out the next four foundational principles. Number one, freedom cannot exist without biblical morality. Not just morality, without biblical morality. Because the only stable, unflexible, unchangeable morality is biblical morality. Number two, ignorance and freedom are mutually exclusive. Ignorance and freedom are mutually exclusive. Number three, not merely our freedom, but our inalienable rights come from God and not from man. And number four, which is foundational to our Constitution, the essence of national freedom is the strict limitation of government. Now on the back of that second insert is a list of a few of the many freedoms that wicked people in our government have removed or tried to remove from Christians, and I hope you read it when you have the time. But for now, let's look for a moment at the tie-in between the verses we read today from 1 Timothy and from the book of Proverbs. This is Memorial Day Sunday, and so it is a day of remembrance. Proverbs chapter 10, verses 6 and 7 gives us an excellent summary of a memory that is honored and of a memory that is not honored. These are parallel verses, verses 6 and 7, and each one tells us something about the just, and each one tells us something about the wicked. The just are mentioned in verse 6 and 7. The wicked are mentioned in verse 6 and 7. In both verses, blessing is attached to the just, that is, to the righteous man. In the first instance, the blessing is upon the head of the just. In other words, the blessing is a current state of being, just like a crown that is placed in honor upon one who is alive. The second verse, we find the just or the righteous person is no longer present. Either he has died or at the least is no longer present to receive the honor for his standards of righteousness. The memory of the just is blessed. The righteous man will have God's present blessing whether or not the world likes it. Because blessing from the divine viewpoint relates to a man or a woman's current position. His or her actual standing in the sight of a holy God who ultimately is the only one who matters. Now we move to the second verse, verse 7. In the second verse, we see how the righteous person is remembered by people. The people who receive godly input from the righteous man or the woman in the past. That produces a blessed memory. Every time those who are left behind remember the righteous person, it brings praise and thanksgiving. The memory of that person is a source of joy, of strength, of motivation to godly service. It's a motivation to encouragement, to be more faithful, more diligent, more heavenly minded. When we remember these folks, and there have been many here in this church that have departed and gone on to glory, when we remember these folks, it doesn't bring pain or hatred or horror or depression. The memory of the just is blessed. Now look at the contrast with the wicked who are also mentioned in both verses. The first verse talks about the mouth of the wicked. The second verse talks about the name of the wicked. Jesus explained that the mouth is the principal means by which the wicked heart is revealed. That's in the first verse. The mouth is the principal means by which the wicked heart is revealed. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus said, Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of his mouth, this defileth a man. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do you not understand that whatsoever goeth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. 
Not only Jesus, but we find other New Testament writers as well. James tells us that the control of the mouth is harder than the control of the body. In James chapter 1 and chapter 3, we read these verses. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. If the tongue can no man tame, it is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Peter and John tell us the same thing about the power of the tongue. In 1 Peter chapter 3, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. John in 1 John chapter 3 verse 18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. There's a lot in those verses, but I'm going to try to summarize it for us. The tongue, the mouth. In time present, the wicked have a lot to say. You hear them talking all the time. They almost never stop. You see, they want to be remembered. Their mouth is full of threats and violence. That's what it said back in our verses in Proverbs. And they think this will get them remembered. The second verse tells us how they will be remembered. The memory of their name will smell like roadkill that is sat in the sun for a couple of days. The name of the wicked shall rot. Have you ever smelled a dead animal up close? <laughs> I hope not, I have. I used to smell them all the time down in Texas. Lots of roadkill. In fact, I think some of those Texans enjoyed seeing if they couldn't catch that animal running across the road before it got away. When you begin to smell a dead animal, you start to vomit. You move away from it as far and as fast as you can. That is the way the name of the wicked will be remembered. It will make you throw up. It will rot and stink in the memory of everyone who thinks about it. You know, there are many names that are blessed in the history of our country. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Patrick Henry, whose words actually motivated the Continental Congress to take up arms. Abraham Lincoln and many, many others. Those names are blessed. We remember them more than 200 years after they were instruments that God used to give us this great land and to deliver it in times of war. You also probably remember some other names of a different character, like Benedict Arnold, who killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel, Nero, the Nazis and their Gestapo, the KGB, Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, Mao Zedong, Castro, Pol Pot, and the killing fields of Cambodia. Or how about, do you remember them? Most of you are old enough to remember them. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who sold U.S. nuclear secrets, top secret radar, sonar, and jet propulsion engines to the Soviet Union at a time when the United States was the only country in the world with the ability to build atomic bombs. How different would the history of the world be today if those secrets had never gotten out? The Rosenbergs were executed exactly 64 years ago next month on June 19, 1953. I was thinking about some of the so-called leaks that we've had recently and people turning over national secrets and nobody seems to think today about dealing with them the same way that the Rosenbergs were dealt with. All of those names are also remembered, and in the United States at least, these names bring anger and repulsion and disgust. 
as with the righteous, we see the present condition and the identifying marks of the wicked in the first verse and the future and ultimate results earned by the wicked man or woman in the second verse. The present condition of a wicked heart is revealed by the mouth. It is covered with violence. The Hebrew word for covereth is kasa, which means to make plump, to fill up. In the end, the wicked is indeed remembered if he is wicked enough, but the memory of his name stinks like a rotting piece of dead meat. On Memorial Day, we remember our brave military, many of them Bible-believing Christians, and many of whom have laid down their lives for our country and the freedoms for which our country has historically stood. They have given their lives both on our own soil and on foreign soil, standing against totalitarian destroyers who have sought to replace the divinely given freedoms that we so much enjoy here in the United States. The founders of our country understood the responsibility of the Christian to his government far better than most American Christians today. Perhaps to gain a better perspective, let me quote from the Declaration of Independence. But first, let me ask you a question. When was the last time you read the Declaration of Independence? Do you even know what's in it? When you forget your heritage, you will lose your heritage. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Oh, people, it brings me to tears when I read these magnificent words. Do you love your country? Do you understand why God has brought it about and given you the freedom you have today? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government, of the governed, excuse me, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its power in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations Pursuing inevitably or invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Now these words are followed 
by the specific causes and abuses placed on the colonies by the king, many of which are uncomfortably similar to the recent abuses of government that we saw under the Obama administration. The final paragraph contains these concluding words. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, unquote. I hope those words move you as they move me. I love this land. What a blessed privilege to be the heirs of these men. I think it should be patently clear, even to the casual observer, that the framers of the Declaration of Independence were relying on higher law, a divine law, the law of nature and of nature's God, in other words, the Bible, to supersede mere human law. Let me say it again. Did you notice the term? Law of nature and of nature's God. Our founding fathers were creationists. They understood that there was a someone outside of and higher than mere naturalism. One of the essential sine qua nones, that means without which nothing elements of freedom, is creator God in charge of his own creation. If you remove that, there is no rational basis for saying that the government, also known as Big Brother, is not the best solution for solving the problems of the world. In that alternative view, might makes right. Survival of the fittest. The educated and elite classes should obviously rule the world. Some races are more evolved than other races. There are no absolute rules, no permanent standards, no unchanging truth, no certainly sexual absolutes. You see, without an external superior standard, there is no reason to resist fiat governmental declarations that the new moral standards are just as good or perhaps even better than the old moral standards. When you leave out the creator, the creature may define himself. Satan understands this and as a result has made a concerted effort to annihilate the teachings of creationism in the public school system, the universities and academia. Creation scientists are boycotted, scorned and ostracized and their papers are rejected by major scientific journals even if they are producing cutting edge scientific research. Some have even been denied Nobel prizes based solely on the fact that they were creationists. I know you've heard me hammer on that, haven't you, lots of times over the last nine years because I believe it with all my heart that this issue is one of the key principles to why we are losing our young people today, why they are leaving the churches in droves, why are they abandoning their faith, why church children are involved in as much animalistic sexual immorality as their pagan counterparts. If we only are higher evolved animals, what is there to stop us from living with barnyard morals? I praise God, I'm going to put in a little advertisement here. I praise God that last year the Presbytery took a Faith Presbytery bus trip to the Answers in Genesis Creation Museum in Kentucky. And I praise God that this year we have scheduled another bus trip to the Ark Encounter, a life-size reproduction of Noah's Ark. And P.S. I hope you sign up for that trip. The pagans hate it because the Ark teaches two clear biblical pictures. Number one, judgment is coming. And number two, God has provided a way of salvation, a way of escape in Jesus Christ, the one who is the ark of our salvation. 
The memory of the just is certainly an appropriate theme for this week as we remember the freedom that God has given to us here in the United States. Tomorrow we celebrate Memorial Day. It is with grateful thanksgiving that we, as United States citizens, look back to all those who sacrificed and fought, and fought, to give us a truly free nation where we can still worship God. I hope you remember what we've been reading in Exodus chapter 15. In the Song of Moses there, there is a statement. It says, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. There is a long war against God going on, and God fights the war. And he will win. Freedom is a rare commodity in the world today. Think about North Korea, and Russia, and communist China, and Saudi Arabia, in Syria, in Lebanon, and Egypt, and the United Arab Emirates, in Cuba, and Abu Dhabi, and Somalia, and Jordan, and Lebanon, and Burma, and major areas of Thailand, and Indonesia, and India and multiple countries in Africa, and South America, and around the world. Freedom is a rare commodity. But what's happening in America? Think about America for a moment, where Christians are suddenly on the defensive in court as they take stands for divine standards of being able to speak the truth. Just for speaking the truth, they're being dragged into court with patently obvious things as men and women are different, that God hates and will judge sodomy and lesbianism and those who practice these perversions, that grown men should not be allowed in the ladies' room with little girls, that teenage boys pretending to be transgendered should not be allowed to take showers with teenage girls. Think of our country where military chaplains are being given dishonorable discharge from the United States military for giving biblical counsel to our armed forces, where our country's leadership is pushing for the draft of teenage girls to be not only the physical defenders of our country on the front lines, but to have bunk with men, where there was a concerted push by our former president to rip away our Second Amendment rights every time a Muslim terrorist killed people instead of pointing out that it is Islam and its followers who are killing Christians and Jews, not guns. What do you think our founding fathers would have done if they'd been alive today? Do you think they wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution so that transgendered persons in the military could have sex changes paid for by taxpayer dollars? Was that why they wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution? Freedom is truly a rare commodity, and it's getting rarer by the day in the United States. The Bible prophesies that there is coming a day in which true freedom will be totally extinguished from the world with the rise of the Antichrist and the mark of the beast where every human on the planet is tracked and controlled. The technology is available today and is being perfected with this goal in mind. The total removal of freedom and the total irreversible control of every man, woman, and child, <laughs> and all those human beings who think there's something else besides men and women, on planet Earth. The work of the devil is about to have its final victory, at least for the present. But there is a God in heaven who will judge the Earth during the Great Tribulation before the second coming of Christ. Praise God that the rapture will happen before the great tribulation. One year ago, I returned from a country where I spent five weeks observing the people with only a thin veneer of temporal freedom. But everywhere I went, there were cameras monitoring my coming and my going. I heard quiet conversations from people who had been pulled into the police stations for questioning. I heard whispered conversations about indigenous Christian believers who have been imprisoned, tortured, killed, 
and some of them had their bodies carved up for organ transplants for others. Four years ago at this time, I had just returned from the same country under the totalitarian domination of atheistic communism, where I helped my daughter and her husband adopt two tiny children. It was, in a sense, a rescue operation to save two castaway children from death, oppressive authoritarianism, miserable lives, pagan philosophy, evolutionary indoctrination, and a vacuum where they probably would never have heard the gospel of Christ. Since then, my daughter and her family adopted two more boys from another totalitarian country where the state plays God. Returning to the United States once again made me realize just how blessed we are to have political, economic, social, and religious freedoms that we so much enjoy here. But that's all temporal. What is true freedom? Our Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul speak of an even more valuable freedom that we have in the New Testament books of John and Romans. Physical freedom is an incredible blessing, but it's only temporary. That is, it only lasts until we die. The Bible deals with people who are truly free versus a people who are under the heavy hand of sin, the oppressive hand of legalism, the enslaved domination of trying to earn salvation or sanctification by the works of the law, and slavery to the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's interesting to note that Jesus principally addressed new believers when he spoke, who often fall prey to the tools of bondage that once enslaved them. The Pharisees are also on the scene like hungry wolves trying to devour the newborn lambs in John 8. As he spake these words, many believed on him. So we're dealing with those who have just trusted Christ. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you, give me that word, free. Jesus is talking about a very special kind of freedom that comes from truth. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were ever in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. The first freedom that Jesus promises is the freedom from sin. Remember that back in verse 34? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. If therefore the son shall make you free, Ye shall be free indeed. Freedom from the slavery of sin comes when you really know the truth. Remember what we just read back in verse 32? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Freedom from sin is exactly the point that Paul makes in Romans 6. Just a few chapters before he speaks of our freedoms and responsibilities to government in chapter 13. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Both Jesus and Paul in these two passages give us the principal boundaries of true Christian liberty. Freedom from sin that releases our chains so that we can serve Christ. Now let's make some application of these principles. The memory of the just. Remember, that's our theme. So as you remember... Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and Samuel and the prophets, does their name rot or is the memory of the just blessed? What about when you remember all the other names of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11? 
Then in the New Testament, what about when you remember the names of Mary and Joseph, Peter and Paul, James and John, Timothy and Titus, Andrew and Bartholomew, and all the rest of the apostles? And what about when you remember the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus at which every knee shall bow? The entire universe will be bow before that name. His is the only name that is truly righteous or just. And indeed, his name will always be blessed. And you've been given the option of having a name that will be blessed or choosing the opposite option, having a name that will rot. Which do you want? A name that is blessed or a name that will stink like the king animal compost? A name that holds no hope for either the present or the future. A name that will never motivate anyone to serve Christ when they remember you in the future. A name that is attached to you, to some miserable, petty, carnal-minded piece of trash that never got his or her nose out of the dirt to breathe the exciting air of heaven. A name that never ran boldly in the race set before it. A name that stinks in the nostrils of God and man. A name that will soon be forgotten, very soon, just as soon as your miserable body hits the bottom of the grave hole. Let me ask you a sobering question. I've thought about this often. Will anybody even remember you? Will anybody even remember you? When was the last time that you thought about the first person who died after I became pastor here nine and a half years ago. When was the last time you thought about them? Do you even remember who that was? First funeral that I did here at this church. You know, I buried a lot of people here. If I don't go home first to heaven, I'll probably bury some of you. Who was the first person I buried after coming here to Collingswood? Friends, wake up. You are going to die soon. Will anybody even give a passing thought about you a year after the day that you die? Have you made any kind of an impact for Christ? You know, everywhere I go, I still meet people who remember my dad, and he died in 1981. That's 36 years ago. And his books and radio broadcasts are still making an impact on people today. The memory of the just is blessed. Not the memory of the moderately good. Not the memory of the easy to get along with. Not the memory of the rich. Not the memory of the invisible Christian. The one who is remembered with blessing is the one who really made a mark for Christ. The people who are remembered are the ones who are totally sold out for Jesus. The ones who led others to Christ and each gave his or her whole heart to the ministry that God placed into their hands. You know some of these names. Polycarp the disciple of the Apostle John. Athanasius, who stood against the Arians. Those were the early Jehovah's Witnesses. Athanasius against the world. Contra mundum. That's how he was known. He didn't care what anybody thought. He stood against the world. Martin Luther. John Calvin. Ulrich Zwingli. Hugh Latimer. Nicholas Ridley, one of my ancestors. Johann Sebastian Bach. George Friedrich Kandel. William Wilberforce, Jonathan Edwards, Dwight L. Moody, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Jim and Betty Elliott, Iris Sankey, Fanny Crosby, John and Charles Wesley, Billy Sunday, John and Betty Stamm, David Livingston, and thousands of others. How true it is. Blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall be rot. So how do we get that blessing? How do we leave a memory that will be blessed? 
It's not a matter of talent or money or position or worldly power and goods. Paul gives us some of the basic keys, which brings us back to that passage we read out of 1 Timothy chapter 1. It can be summarized in just a few words. Love, faith, good conscience, obedience, good warfare. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. Same thing he said back in verse 5. He picks it back up in verse 19. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. If you have no agape love, you won't make the cut. If you have no genuine faith, you won't pass the grade. If you have a defiled conscience, you'll never be remembered. If you stubbornly refuse to obey, you'll be forgotten with just as soon as your casket hits the bottom of the grave hole. If you refuse to fight the good fight of faith with all your heart, you'll be dropped from the list of winners and dumped like garbage into the backwater category of also rans. Let me close this Memorial Day Sunday with a brief illustration. The memory of the just. Tell me, into which category do the following instance or incidents fall? Both of these events occurred within the past week. On May 23rd, a pop concert in a gigantic stadium was just ending in Manchester, England. A lot of moms and their preteen and pre-teenage daughters were in attendance. A 20-year-old Muslim man of Libyan descent walked into the crowded lobby as the concert ended and detonated a suicide bomb, killing 22 and wounding 120. Terrified parents hunted frantically for their children. A homeless man rushed in from outside to help and held a wounded woman in his arms until she died. As of the writing of this message, nine other terrorists in this cell group have been arrested, people who assisted the planning of the attack in procuring the parts for the bombs and the explosives, people who knew about the attack and encouraged it. This pervert's twisted mind thought he was killing little girls and moms to get glory. He was going to get a place in heaven and 70 virgins on 70 beds and 70 palaces. Pervert. And it was less than 24 hours since President Trump had confronted 40 Muslim world leaders and told them that they are personally responsible for stopping terrorism from flowing out of their countries, that they are personally responsible for monitoring, arresting, and crushing terrorism in their own nations. Less than 24 hours later, this happened. Tell me, was this suicide bombing an act of amazing courage, killing little girls and women? Was the bomber one of the just, one of the righteous, whose name will be blessed? Or is he one of the demonic wicked whose name will rot forever with a putrefying stench? Was he a hero or was he, as President Trump put it, a real loser? Was he a macho cool guy or was he a miserable little piece of twisted trash? How about another? Two days ago, on May 26th, right after President Trump finished his first foreign tour of international interaction with world leaders, including being in Israel for talks with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, a busload of Coptic Christians in Egypt, two days ago, was ambushed by Muslim terrorists who surrounded the bus and riddled it with bullets, killing at least 28 people while chanting, Allah Akbar, God is great and taking video selfies of themselves as they committed murder. Apparently all but three children were massacred. You know, it was a celebration. It was the killer's way of celebrating the beginning of the Muslim feast of Ramadan because they left behind multiple pamphlets about this so-called Muslim holy month. Tell me, was the true God of heaven pleased? Will the true God of heaven remember them with blessing? Or will their filthy names rot in hell for the rest of eternity? This is not rocket science. On this Memorial Day Sunday, we also honor not only our military, but men and women like those who were killed 
our brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world who are laying down their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what Paul told Timothy? This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Friends, we are in a war, but it's not a carnal war. It is a spiritual war. The murders and suicide attacks that we see are merely physical manifestations of the long war against God in the spirit realm. The devil and his followers are murderers in this world. Jesus said so in John 8. But the real source of evil and the battle plans are being laid out in the spirit realm. Listen to what Paul says about that in 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 lists the spiritual armor that makes that clear. You are in a war whether you like it or not. So let me ask you the question. What are you going to actually do? How you fight that war will either put you in the category of those whose names are blessed or it will put you in the category of these, those whose name will rot. How will you be remembered on this Memorial Day? You must decide. The choice is yours. Make that decision wisely and give your whole heart and soul and life to Jesus Christ. The memory of the just is blessed. But the name of the wicked shall rot. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for reminding us on this day that your call is to righteousness, to holiness, to godliness, to purity, and that your blessing currently rests upon the head of those who are living that way and who have been justified by faith in Christ. But those who reject him, those who oppose him, those who worship false gods that motivate them to murder, the name of the wicked shall rot. Father, I pray for all those who are here present when our name goes down in history that there will be a memory it will be a memory of those who are just and it will be a memory that is blessed we commit these things to you in Jesus name Amen our closing hymn for today is number 344 grace greater than our sin you can't be just without grace Grace is greater than your sin. It doesn't matter what you've done. God has grace for you and can bring you into fellowship when you trust in Jesus Christ alone. The Bible says there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The name Jesus, not the name of his mother, not the name of the saints, the name of Jesus. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Have you trusted him? Do you have the blessing of God resting on you now? It's only by the grace of God. Let's stand and sing number 304.